Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers from Fiji to Turkey of the Asia Pacific region and beyond. My name is Jose, and to our viewers, thank you very much for joining us today in our productivity talk organized by the Asian Productivity Organization or the APO. Today's P talk topic is quality education under crisis. We all know that COVID-19 has struck our educate, education system like a lightning bolt and shaken it with score. It is like a thief in the night. We just woke up one day and things have changed completely right before us in almost all aspects of our life. We are now adjusting to a new reality that we couldn't imagine just a few months ago. The outbreak has disrupted the school year of millions of students across the world, like their closing schools and universities to limit the spread of COVID-19. However, some countries are now poised to or have already started to reopen schools. Along with this, governments are also setting up systems that will expand the use of technology as an alternative to in-school instruction, such as online classes. On the other hand, educators are discussing how to reimagine education system in ways that will shift from a classroom and teacher-centered model towards technology-based learning, or a combination of both. So today's speed talk will discuss these issues that affect the quality education under crisis and how it will impact to sustainable development and productivity in the long run. So to share their insights and experience and expertise on this issue, we are very pleased to have with us today, Professor Yuto Kitamura from the Graduate School of Education, the University of Tokyo, Japan, and Professor Nizam, the Acting Director General of Higher Education, uh, Ministry of Education and Culture in Indonesia. Welcome and good afternoon, Professor Kitamura and Professor Nizam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. We would like to encourage our viewers to send your questions and comments in the chat corner for our guest experts to answer during the Q&A session. Now we would like to invite Professor Kitamura for his presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, -san, and then uh, thank you very much for the APO for giving me this opportunity. Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening for everyone watching this uh, uh, show today. And before starting my talk, I sincerely express uh, I mean, that my feeling that I feel sorry for the, those people who are suffering from the COVID-19 currently. But I hope that you know we can overcome this uh, difficult situation, and uh, I hope uh, you know uh, my talk can be of some uh, hint for uh, those people who are interested in education to deal with uh, uh, the, the situation we call post or with Corona. Uh, so I hope you know you can uh, get something out of my talk. Okay, so let me start with my uh, presentation. Okay, so my, my talk is quality education under crisis. So the point I like to first raise is that uh, due to the COVID-19, uh, we in, in improving the societal productivity, we have to take a look at the triangular relationship amongst uh, education, health, and social stabilities. These three issues are quite linked, and then particularly education is a key so today, I really would like to discuss about why and how education is important to improve uh, these situations and then also try to overcome the problems. Today, I particularly would like to focus on the context of uh, developing countries because those are the places and societies which have been struggling more. So my talk, of course, in general, I mean, covers both developed and developing countries, but also I'd like to highlight that we really need to provide more support to developing countries. And, and then, you know, before starting about uh, this issue of COVID-19 and how education is affected, I just would like to uh, remind you that education is very important key field 
to, in, to, to help the society grow their economies. So that's very obvious. And then because of this, you know, many countries have been trying to improve the educational situations to develop their societies. However, today, because of COVID-19, uh, many countries, particularly the developing countries, are really, really struggling. But then, as I said, we need to uh, provide more support to uh, developing countries. But the one of the difficult challenge for us today is that uh, how we could convince those people who are in so-called developed countries, which must provide support to developing countries. Why? Because uh, the COVID-19 has been influencing no matter you are in developed or developing countries. So people in developed countries may feel that, uh, you know, we are also struggling. And why do we need to support? Why do we need to help other countries? You know, that's of course you know very selfish idea. But at the same time, when you are really struggling from the situations, you know how we could uh, make uh, uh, the domestic general public in developed countries accepting the idea that we need to support more to developing countries. Okay, so this is this is a slide I was talking about the triangular relationship amongst the education, health, and the social stability. And then the situation is more serious in developing countries. And then could you go next slide? So this is uh, the uh, quite known figure, uh, the study shown that showing that uh, education always matters for the economic growth of the country. So I was discussing that uh, we have to particularly support developing countries to help, but. Uh, Obviously, COVID-19 has been influencing both, no matter whether you are in developed or developing countries. So the general public in developed countries, uh, how we could convince them to you know, help developing countries. Then next slide, please. Yes, then uh, there are three reasons. First and the most important reason is the humanitarian perspective. You know, education is a basic human right. And then uh, for people having uh, you know decent life, but at the same time, in order to build peace around the world, uh, education is very important because uh, it promotes uh, political, economic, and social stability. And also, if you take a look at uh, the causes of the conflicts, often the case the ignorance is the case, the reasons. So if education has been disseminated then people understand and the people accept uh, and the people understand each other you know different cultures then you know, we could promote more peaceful situations around the world and then the last uh, but uh, not the least uh, of course you know that education is important for the economic growth as i said and then now days uh, economy has been globalized and then uh, even the people in developed countries you know we have been strongly connected with the uh, people in developing countries, you know, uh, through this, uh, you know, global value chains, the global economy has been promoting. So could you go to the next slide, please? And then uh, next slide, please. And then, you know, we know that, uh, of course, as I said, uh, it's not only developing countries, but the developed countries, you know, we are now struggling to support, to continue education. As the UNESCO figure shows, a large number of populations, particularly the younger generations, have been struggling to have access to educational opportunities. In fact, uh, you know, personally, I'm, I like to tell this because, uh, you know, for instance, I have a uh, uh, 13 years old daughter who just uh, entered uh, junior high school last April. However, last three months she couldn't come to school, although she became the junior high school student because uh, you know school was closed. It's pity, and but uh, at the same time, people are trying to uh, you know come up with other means to provide educational opportunities. So, could you go to the next slide, please? 
So now the distance learning has been highlighted. Could you go to the next slide, please? And, but if you take a look at this uh, uh, data, you can easily understand that uh, people in developed countries are more fortunate to have different uh, means to have this learning, while the lower or lower middle countries, uh, they, they are lower or low, low or lower middle income countries. You know, they, the kids in those countries are really struggling to have different means, you know, to have the distance learning opportunities. Could you go to the next slide, please? So now we understand that there is a limited opportunities for education, you know, resulting from school shutdowns. And then although the, we are now promoting distance learning or remote learning or online lessons, however, those many of those are incomplete. You know, you cannot uh, totally replace the on-site class, classroom learning because education really, you know, in education, we really need to have uh, interactions between teachers and students and amongst the students. Also, I like to point out that uh, because of this uh, uh, distance learning, as we could see between the high income country and low income countries, high income countries have more means to provide distance learning while low income countries do not. And also within the countries, you know, uh, those kids with a higher socioeconomic status, they maybe have better uh, means to uh, do the distance learning while the kids from the lower socioeconomic status, they are really struggling. So the impact inequality has been widening, widened. So that's also a very serious problem. Another serious problem due to the COVID-19 is that because of school shutdowns, some of the kids who may be abused at home do not have the place to escape because school has been a safe place for many kids who are struggling in, at their home. Also, you know, many countries, the school has uh, periodic medical checkups. For instance, in case of Japan, you know, uh, every new academic calendar, when students enter the school, we have the periodic medical checkup. And then when the doctor checks the kids, they can often find out that child abuse. So these kind of opportunities have been banned because of the school shutdowns. Also, there's another issue. Many kids in developing countries, as well as some kids in even developed countries, they are not having enough uh, nutritious uh, intake because school lunches are not provided. And then, you know, those who are very poor, they may not be able to have enough food at home or they may be abused. So the health issue has been also, you know, we cannot uh, uh, neglect it. Could you go to the next slide, please? And particularly uh, due to the, um, regarding the distance learning, for instance. Could you go to the next slide, please? The developing countries have been, as I said, uh, you know, very struggling, but also developed countries as well. And then women seems to be having, women, and girls and women have been having more difficulties. For the person with disabilities, in fact, uh, sometimes online education is very much helpful. I mean, so I'm not really saying uh, online education or distance learning is bad. In fact, distance learning is very, very important, but uh, at the same time, we have to take into consideration the conditions surrounding the students and schools. So we cannot naively believe that, you know, uh, distance learning can be simple solution for these uh, difficult conditions. Next slide, please. And then here I would like to highlight uh, the one, another factor in the triangular amongst the education, health, and the social stability. Because education is very important for kids to have uh, you know, relevant health literacy. And so in order to have a healthy life, we have to really 
promote health literacy among the people. And then education does very important roles. Particularly in the post or with corona, I would say health literacy is very important because you know uh, people need to understand how to behave. Okay. We are now saying social distancing or physical distancing is very important to prevent uh, uh, infectious disease uh, for the infectious disease control. So for preventing the infections of the disease, you have to really understand the importance of social distancing or physical distancing. That's also part of the health literacy. Could you go to the next slide, please? And education experience is very, very important. Uh, I mean, this is not uh, the data uh, from Asia. This is data uh, from Africa. Could you uh, show, could you click? I'm asking the secretariat to click once. And this is a bit old data from Sub-Saharan Africa. About 10 years ago, more, you know, 4.4 uh, million infants died before age five. Uh, another quick piece, but if mother has primary education, then we could reduce to 4.2 million. And another quick piece, the secretariat piece. However, if mothers have secondary education, you know, you could help you know, you could make it half. It's, this is, uh, you know, quite amazing and the powerful uh, impact that education can make. Also, recently, I mean, many countries have been having the uh, issue of uh, obesity. And if you could see this, you know, obesity is uh, very much a, uh, linked to the issue of income gap. Could you, could you go to the next slide? Sorry, the secretariat, could you go to the next slide? Um, secretariat, could you go to the uh, slide 12? Yes, uh, this is showing the correlation between the level of obesity and income gaps. And obesity and the hunger, these are both uh, quite serious uh, problems. Here. But obesity has been becoming more and more serious these days. Could you go to the next slide, please? And then click. Could you go to the next slide? And it is surprising that we are having more problem of obesity in developing countries. Could you click one? Could you click one? Click, please click. Because, you know, as you can see, the kids in developing countries are becoming more and more having problem with this. And in order to overcome this kind of problems, the health literacy is very key. And then why I'm talking about this issue of obesity, because when the schools are shut down, kids have to stay home. And then this issue of obesity is now becoming more and more obvious. Could you go to the next slide? This will be the uh, last uh, third factor of triangular uh, relationship amongst education, health, and social stability. And we have to understand the crisis within the crisis. You know, there are uh, high intensity or and middle in, medium intensity conflict. Con uh, conflict. The countries have been. Uh, having the uh, high intensity and medium intensity conflict have been shutting down uh, schools nationwide. And then these, these are countries which cannot really provide the distance learning as well. So they are not only struggling from uh, conflict, but now the COVID-19 has been hitting. So dual burden for the, the, these countries. That's why we call crisis within a crisis. And particularly, as you know, the girls, women, and the person with disabilities are difficult conditions. Could you go to the next slide, please? And so what are we, ex these are the, uh, the situations that, are, I mean, the people, and particularly the young generations 
around the world, particularly in Asia, we've been struggling from. And so what the education can do, what is expected to education to do, you know? Education is now becoming more transformative and we have to think of the more flexible ways of teaching and learning. Why? Because the situation around the world has been changing so rapidly and then, you know, the labor market has been also changing. For instance, this, is, this graph shows uh, how the uh, simple routine type of skills are not uh, required uh people with uh, only the routine or simple uh, manual skills are probably losing the jobs and then you know more and more required for the uh complicated uh, tasks with the new information so could you go to the next slide please and then this pace of change is uh, quite accelerated because due to the uh, technological development could you go to the next slide please and we see this, uh, uh, you know, the rapid expansion of the techno technological uh, advancement. Could you go to the next slide, please? So what do we need? We need to promote the flexible learning that can promote innovations. And we've been basically trying to transmit the systematized knowledge and skills to the to the students and the young generations that's the conventional and traditional mode of teaching and learning however today is not the, the era for simply transferring knowledge and skills but we have to uh, you know uh, encourage students to be more ex uh, to explore the new knowledge and new skills because the situation has been changing so rapidly so they have to learn the way how to learn you know, new knowledge and skills please go to the next slide of course uh, like a distance including the distance learning could you go to the next slide please ict information communication technologies can be can help you know people to uh, acquire such new uh, knowledge and skills However, we also have to uh, think of the uh, values and attitudes that those kids, students acquire. You know, they have to be very, very flexible. And uh, you cannot just follow what we have been doing for many years in the past. But uh, then I would like to highlight that there may be some opportunities for developing countries. Why? Because now we have a concept so called diverse innovations. What is happening in developing countries is more clearly visible. I mean, for instance, global challenges such as climate change, biodiversity and so on and so forth. These are much more visible and uh, you know existing in the context of developing countries and the people know how to deal with. I mean, of course, people are, at the same time, people are struggling and suffering from. However, at the same time, they have been dealing with those challenges. So if we see the you know, more indigenous knowledge generated in the context of developing countries, there may be some hint for other countries to deal with these global challenges as well. So you cannot just say the knowledge created or knowledge generated in developed countries are always better than the knowledge created in developing countries. Actually, it is mixed, you know. These are the situations today. And could you go to the next slide, please? And this is a very famous uh, fi uh, figure. So some of you may have seen before. The, today, could you, yes, uh, before, in the education sector, we are always trying to provide equal education opportunities to the people. I mean, however, those who are struggling, those who have more disadvantage, they couldn't, uh, you know, deal with the equal distribution of resources. So now we are always trying to think of the equitable distribution of resources, which is in the middle of these figures. So within these, among these three pictures, 
the equity has been very important. But equity is not enough. Because as this picture shows, if we could change the system, then we may be able to solve the problems. So could you go to the last slide? So this is the conclusion of my short talk. Uh, you know, uh, there is a, I have highlighted the triangle of education, health, social stability, which is now in danger. Then I have also highlighted the situation in developing countries, uh, uh, much more serious problem. I mean, they are having the much more serious problems. And then we have to provide more support and aid to these developing countries. Uh, we have to anticipate that uh, uh, Africa and Latin America can be the next place. Actually, in fact, uh, you know, including some country like Brazil and some others, we see the increasing uh, uh, impacts uh, of the COVID-19 in these continents. So we have to think of the, uh, how to work together to support, to provide support to developing countries. And also highlighting the importance of education. I would like to really emphasize the importance of flex learning, which can produce uh, or promote innovation. We cannot just deliver the set knowledge, set of knowledge and skills, you know, because the situation has been changing so quite so rapidly. So the teaching and learning process has to be very, very dynamic. And in order to make the process dynamic, we have to really create a network of different uh, stakeholders. And that's that's the way to change the system, you know, uh, faster in order to provide help to developing countries. We are trying to promote equitable distribution of resources as the picture shows. But at the same time, you know, we have to change the system and the education is actually key to come up with uh, innovations. And when we talk about education and education, role of education to promote innovations, we cannot just depend on the context of developed countries, but we really can learn, we can really learn from the uh, various different countries because we have a lot of different experiences around the world. And some of the countries have been doing much, much better than the, uh, for instance, you know, uh, developed countries. So if you are in, you know, if education sector, please try not to give up and then, you know, try to continue promoting the innovations. So this is the last remark, final remark I like to say, you know, every, every time we always say through every dark night, there is a bright day. I hope, you know, there are many, many bright days. So now we have to go through very dark nights However, you know, I, I, we should strongly build the power of education and then, uh, you know, I hope uh, there will be a lot of uh, bright sunny days. Um, I apologize for the, uh, some trouble with the technology, I mean, with uh, our technological setup, but uh, I hope, uh, you know, you could uh, uh, pick up some of the issues I, I wanted to highlight. And again, thank you very much for listening and thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kitamura. That's a very insightful discussion. And you also took us to not just a situation of one country, but uh, with many examples. So now we would like to move on to one specific example of the case. I think you mentioned many countries from Asia and Latin America and and even in, uh, in South Africa, for example. So now uh, we would like to invite Professor Nizam for his uh, presentation. Thank you, Jose. Uh, thank you, Prof. Kitamura, for the very uh, exciting presentation. Uh, allow me to share my screen. Is it seen now, the presentation? Yes, sir. So please make it our uh, full screen. Okay. Okay. So, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me for this uh, excellent opportunity, the APO Productivity uh, Talks. Uh, I would like to share with you some of the 
uh, experience in Indonesia, especially in the higher education uh, sectors on this uh, education at the time of uh, crisis, online learning and beyond the online uh, learning. So first of all, this is my uh, structure of presentations. I will give you a small background of information about Indonesia and the education system in Indonesia. And the strategy of the government uh, in mitigating the COVID-19 and responding to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and survey on online learning implementations in the higher education and some talks about beyond COVID-19 and moving forward to the new uh, normal. So Indonesia is an archipelagic uh, country with uh, 17,000 island, 130 million uh, labor workforce and also 55 million students all over the country. We have 583 dialects and so it's a big, uh, huge system in terms of education and diversity and all the issues related to education are there. So in terms of the higher education sectors, uh, we have more than 4,000 higher education institutions, a small one to the big one, serving 8.1 million students. Uh, in terms of internet connectivity and readiness, uh, there are more than 175 million internet users and 160 million social media users, especially the millennials and post-millennials kids. There are more uh, subscription, subscriptions to the mobile phones than the number of populations. And of course, uh, most of them are Facebook users, Instagrams, Twitters, and the, and the like. Uh, so online learning, uh, what I want to uh, emphasize is that actually uh, in terms of technology, it's not a new thing because we already initiated the use of technology since early 2000 with the establishment of Global Development Learning Network Indonesia and the Indonesia Higher Education Research Network. And in 2015, sorry, it's not 15, we introduced a national platform for sharing like the MOOCs uh, between university, among universities. And we are about to launch the Indonesia Cyber Education Institute uh, last year. It was inaugurated last year, but about to be launched uh, this year. But due to this pandemic, we, we postponed somehow uh, this uh, process. Then, and there comes the COVID-19 pandemics as the mega disruptors of the century. So all the plan uh, has to be shifted, all our habits has to be uh, moved from uh, post, uh, previous normal to the new uh, normal. In terms of the uh, education sector in Indonesia, the policy of the uh, ministry, uh, ministry uh, issued an, a decree in the 9th of March, that's the about uh, one week after the first case was discovered in Indonesia to instruct everyone to study from home to prevent the pandemic uh, spread and to promote a healthy uh, habit in schools and campuses. We also try to mobilize and preparing our medical faculties and university hospitals, uh, especially for uh, developing the national capacity for testing center for COVID-19. Uh, at the time, the national capacity is very weak, about 1,000 uh, tests per day. So we mobilize our faculty of engineering, uh, uh, faculty of medical, and also university hospitals to conduct the test for COVID-19. At the same time, we prepare our university hospitals uh, as a patient treatment center for COVID-19. So more than uh, 16 uh, medical faculties and university hospitals are mobilized for this uh, purpose. And we also prepare 18,000 beds uh, at the training centers uh, under the Ministry of Education and Culture for self-isolation and quarantine for people under observations, or we call it uh, with someone who has uh, in touch with a positive patient. And we also mobilize student volunteers to help uh, with COVID-19 mitigations, especially through uh, promote, promotion, uh, information, and education. Uh, we also mobilize our campuses to conduct applied research to mitigate the pandemic, like the protective equipment, medical equipment, 
devices, pharmaceutical products, and uh, many uses of artificial intelligence, socioeconomic response, and uh, others. Uh, so for the online learning, we since it is like a shift in habits in just a few days, so no preparation before, but all of a sudden, all those 4,000 uh, universities and higher education institutions move into technology. So we have to prepare in a short time to, to provide platforms that uh, some of the institution might not already have the learning management system, for instance, and even the content. Many uh, do not have the content for online learning. So teachers, professors have to shift from classroom, from Blackboard and PowerPoint into uh, online learning. So at national level, we, we uh, provide through what we call SPADA, the, the uh, joint platform of university collaboration in online learning uh, with contents and also free access uh, platform. Uh, we also collaborate with Google, Amazon Web Service, and others to provide resources for university to use. This is the SPADA, the uh, national platform for sharing online courses between universities. And currently, more than uh, 300 universities joining this uh, SPADA platform with more than 3,000 uh, courses uh, available for free for everyone to uh, any student to access. Uh, one week, uh, uh, one month after the uh, initiation of uh, instruction to work from home, study from home, we conduct a survey on the online learning. Uh, within about 10 days, we uh, gather more than 2,000 uh, students, collected uh, online survey. Uh, this is the, the uh, basic facts, but most are female. Uh, they are the more responsive to this survey. And on the right, this is the uh, year uh, of entry of the of the students. So mostly are the new, the first year students, 37%. Uh, and as the longer they stay in the university, uh, less response come from them. Uh, geographically, it covers almost uh, all part of the country, although the percentage is uh, low in some area and very high in others, and depending on the uh, university uh, response to our survey. And this graph shows that, this chart shows that almost all universities within one month after the instruction has transformed the teaching and learning process from classroom into online learning. So within one month, 98.16% uh, of all 4,000, almost 4,500 uh, institutions already uh, move into online uh, learning. And uh, when we ask the students on what they do with the online learning, they just use their hand phone. So hand phone now become the source of learning. So the, we, the trans, we transfer the classroom into uh, cell phones. And few use notebooks and desktop and very few use uh, tablets. These others mean they do not have technology actually to access the online learning. So this is the uh, issue of equity and gap uh even if, we, if they use notebook and desktop they use handphone as the uh, means of getting access to the internet that is using the tethering and this 3.9 percent is tethering for from other devices uh, i mean uh, student and dormitory they share uh, their quota internet quota with uh, student from in the next room for instance, so this is uh, testing. So this is amazing transformation that happened within a short period of time. And the mode of delivery, uh, many still use uh, mixed mode between asynchronous and synchronous, and more using asynchronous than uh, fully synchronous uh, mode. This also comes with the issues <clears throat> coming from students because they protest with the 
online learning, the cost of uh, data connection, internet become uh, expensive to them. So usually they get access from campus using the uh, free Wi-Fi in campus. Now they have to spend their uh, pocket money to buy the internet connection. In terms of, of applications, uh, Google Class and Zoom is the most used uh, synchronous application used by uh, teachers as well as students and followed by uh, others in a small percentage. Uh, readiness and understanding. Student readiness, uh, although uh, as uh, I said earlier, it is a very short time preparation to move online, but in fact, they are uh, relatively ready for uh, embarking on uh, online learning. 60% uh, of the respondents uh, say they are ready and even very ready to uh, get into online learning. This is not surprising because uh looking at the percentage or uh, the number of students that uh, actively uh, socially and uh, online like the uh, instagram facebook uh, this indicates that their uh, digital literacy is quite uh, high uh, and if we delve into those non-ready usually it's related to the poor connectivity and the cost of connection uh, that they have to pair so after one month of uh, online courses, we uh, check the student understanding and most of them uh, seems okay. 5% uh, say very well, uh, understanding the content of the courses. 30% say as well, and average uh, fair, 33.5%, uh, uh, and only 28% say it's poor and very poor. Uh, and the lecture quality, uh, this is also amazing, uh, given that the lecturers perhaps not even ready with the online learning, never come to a training before, but uh, in the perspective of students, they are uh, relatively uh, okay. 45% say it, it was good, and 14% uh, say it's very good even, uh, and poor and very poor only 13%. Uh, in terms of teaching materials, also uh, relatively okay. Uh, and the problem that students uh, face is poor connectivity, poor connectivity uh, to get access to the online uh, learning. So this is a big issue uh, given the geographical spread of Indonesia and also given the economic background of students, this is uh, can become a dividing, uh, another dividing barrier between the rich and the poor. Uh, this is the, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, online learning uh, as students perceive. Um, to many of them, it is a new experience and they don't need to go to campus. This is uh, two of the main thing that they see uh, good thing about uh, going online and more flexible, more relaxed, because they can uh, enjoy the class while uh, staying on bed. Uh, and the disadvantage is connection. Again, the infrastructure is the most problem student uh, and even lecturer face. And because many of the lecturers are not well prepared for the online classes, most of them just give more exercises to students. So they thought that students only work on their own, on the, on the, uh, on the lecture homeworks. The, uh, he or she do not remember that there are 10 lectures that the student attend. So this become a heavy burden for the student. Uh, and if we uh, see the correlation between the preparation for online learning and the and the uh, achievement, uh, there's a really strong correlation between the prepa preparedness and the uh, uh, understanding of the course. So the more prepared the student, the better the, they understand the, the, the uh, course materials. And uh, in terms of the internet connectivity, as we can expect, the poor connectivity uh, results in poor uh, online interaction, online courses. 
And another important factor is the preparedness of the teachers, of the staff, of the professors. Uh, well prepared teachers give uh, good results in terms of student understanding on the courses, as well as the preparation for the course material. So this uh, survey uh, lead us into the preparation for the next uh, semester, next terms, uh, by giving the staff and lecturers some upgrading training on preparing the course and the use of technology more efficiently, more effectively for online uh, learning. When you ask the student uh, what they prefer, online or offline, most still uh, at the end uh, say that offline is still uh, preferable with many advantages of the uh, offline as well as the advantages of the online, but they still feel that the human-to-human -human interaction is still very important. For those that pre uh, prefer for online, uh, as we can expect, are those that is more ready to use technology than those that is not uh, so used to technology. So in conclusion for this part, uh, that students mostly agree that the internet infrastructure is not ready and become one of the main handicap for effective online learning. And handphone is the most used device for the online learning. And student readiness is one important factor for the success of the online learning, as well as the preparedness of the teachers in uh, conducting this uh, online course is the key factors. And now beyond the online learning, uh, how we give meaning to education at the time of crisis. Benjamin Franklin uh, said that in any adversity, there are opportunities. So these opportunities we need to seek uh, and reflect. Uh, so in, in the past three months, we uh, try to promote many modes of education from home, not only online learning. Uh, even in online learning, students can take courses from other campus, not uh, always from their own campus. They can take uh, courses from MOOCs, from U Coursera, Udemy, so it enriches the uh, course materials as well as experience of students. And also we promote student humanitarian volunteers. This is considered as part of the learning uh, credit, so they can volunteer uh, for humanitarian uh, voluntary work. Uh, to mitigate pandemic, to uh, inform and to educate uh, their neighbors and things like that. Uh, this is part of their credit. And also student projects. There are many projects like uh, making face shields, uh, protective class, and other things that they uh, develop as part of the uh, projects. And also applied research with the uh, professors, with uh, lecturers, researchers, and in fact, many uh, devices uh, come out from these uh, activities. So this is the student volunteers. Uh, more than 15,000 uh, medical students join this voluntary work. And uh, they are uh, excellent in promoting the uh, mitigation for the uh, pand this pandemic. Uh, this is also other activities like the volunteers in uh, making uh, face masks or face shields, uh, protective class, uh, maskers, and uh, many other things. So this is, has been very useful and help the, the community, the society to uh, mitigate the, the uh, pandemic. Again, given the spread of Indonesia with 17,000 islands, this activities is very useful. Uh, this is just uh, an illustration of their activities uh, and their, their creativity using drone for uh, disinfection, uh, using drone uh, to help uh, screening and other things, use of artificial intelligence and development of uh, like sterilization box, uh, developing uh, rapid tests, uh, this is the uh, professors with some students uh, under his, her supervisions. The RT lamp test, uh, robots for uh, nurse robotics that uh, helps uh, patients in intensive care. So many things. Uh, even uh, these ventilators, this is 
built from scratch. Uh, the software, the hardware, it's not assembling uh, parts, but uh, everything starts from scratch. This is the uh, very interesting project that uh, professors and students made. And just within two months, the uh, more than 11 prototypes has been produced and has been tested in hospitals. And now they come into production. So this is quite uh, an interesting thing come out from these uh, activities. Lesson learned that uh, rapid adaptation to the use of technology in delivering course uh, happened in the past uh, three months. Online learning promotes independent learning skills and creativity, which is the skills of the uh, 21st century. Uh, work from home is not less productive than work at the office. Uh, we uh, proved that more than 16,000 innovation and invention uh, come out from these activities. And creative energy during this, this pandemic is amazing. Uh, increased productivity, in fact. So more publication from uh, professors, more uh, patent now being uh, uh, filed, and also uh, go into production. Thousands of invention and innovation resulted from these uh, activities. The spirit of Kotong Royong working together, together, sharing the spirit is uh, very strong during this uh, pandemic. Uh, so toward the new normal, uh, good practices that we uh, developed during this uh, past three months into the new normal need to be maintained and improved. Uh, better use of technology, better teaching and student experience need to be in place and infrastructure need to be improved. The use of technology to enhance learning process opens up new horizon. First, online learning promote independent self-directed learning. So we uh, train students more to, to, to be more independent as the goals of 21st century learning to be independent learners. Education resources and delivery, this needs to be improved and collaboration across institutions within campuses, even with overseas campuses, they can uh, share courses. Online learning and rich student learning process and experience, but not fully replace offline learning. We uh, understand and believe that. So now we are in, in the process of how to deliver like laboratory works and uh, research uh, with the proper uh, safety measures. Lecturers need to adapt and relearn uh, changing role of professors in the future as co-pilot of learning explorations and co-creation with students. Uh, so currently uh, we are preparing, we are uh, ongoing in this uh, training for 100,000 lecturers across the country. So there are many ways of learning need to be explored, collaborative learning, cross-disciplinary online learning, and volunteer humanitarian activities. This need to be enhanced currently. Uh, thousands of students are uh, joining this uh, project and independent project as well as research on recovery to the new normal uh, need to be uh, enhanced further. Improvement uh, in online learning, method of delivery, assessment, feedback, uh, and learning management, and training and upgrading on online learning technology for lecturer and students, and improvement of learning materials. And of course, strengthening and improvement of learning platform and infrastructures. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nizam. That is a very uh, good sharing of your experience in Indonesia. And uh, we have some questions, and I also have some questions, but maybe I would like to uh, get the question first from our viewers who are watching this program now. So I know that uh, our discussion, uh, for example, like Professor Nizam, my understanding is that has focused more on the higher education uh, program of, of the government. But uh, let me just raise this question in general. Uh, there is a question from Marcus Barber. Uh, is there an ad advantage for online education or online learning? And sometimes these girls are uh, last considered for school and first taken out. So when there is a crisis, uh, girls are always uh, the first one to, to leave schooling. So if all school was online, might it allow more girls to attend? So uh, uh, if you have any idea, like if this is the case in Indonesia or what's the case in Indonesia or Professor Kitamura, if you have seen this happening uh, even in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could share your experience to us. 
Yeah. So uh, may I answer the question? Yes. yes, sir. Please go ahead, Professor Nizam. Yeah. As you can see from the uh, survey in the higher education, more students, uh, more uh, ladies are actually, girls are actually responding to our survey. Uh, in our uh, student populations, there are more girls actually than boys uh, in all level from elementary to uh, university level. And the higher the education, the more women are there in the system. So it's a problem with boys now <laughs> in Indonesia. So in terms of uh, schools, that is the uh, K to 12, uh, in addition to the online learning, because the, the, the coverage and reach of the technology infrastructure is not go into the small villages and the remote places, the government uh, is using the national televisions to broadcast uh, teaching. So from morning till 10, it's for elementary schools, from 10 to 12 for junior high school, up to 12 for uh, senior high school. So this has been uh, quite effective. So from Monday to Saturday, this uh, broadcast from national television has been used as a means of uh, teaching delivery in elementary to uh, high school. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. How about Professor Kitamura? Yes, uh, in fact, uh, in some countries, in some societies, yes, if uh, the online education will be more uh, widely uh, implemented, then probably that will provide more opportunities for not only girls, but, uh, you know, so-called uh, vulnerable group of people, like, uh, you know, I mentioned about the disabilities, I mean, kids with disabilities or uh, kids living in the remote areas, like Professor Nizam just mentioned. So. I think, uh, you know, the online or uh, not necessarily internet online, but the distance learning or remote learning can uh, create more opportunities. However, however, the problem is that uh, uh, using TV, probably okay, using TV or radio, that's, that's probably the uh, basic means to give more opportunities. But if you like to advance the means of providing uh, uh, remote or distance learning, then you must use uh, uh, online learning system. Then I would say that these vulnerable group of populations will probably have difficulties to have access, I mean, access to the internet. As uh, Professor Nizam's survey also sketched out that uh, the internet access is very serious problem for the uh, people, even those university students in Indonesia. So you could imagine if, you know, those are about more K-12 uh, system and then, you know, those who are uh, living in the remote or rural areas. Uh, so I, I say, you know, distance and the, uh, remote learning can be a good way to expand opportunities. However, the infrastructure is probably the key and then this is actually true even in the context like Japan. Uh, in Japan, we have also shifted, uh, tried to shift to the online learning while the schools are closed. But uh, uh, many, many students, many, many households had uh, problems to have a uh, uh, decent online access. So in fact, this uh, infrastructure issue is very serious for many, 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 many countries, I say. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So there is another question here uh, uh, from the Philippines, uh, Mr. Alvin Principe. So uh, I think uh, if I may add to his question is that the presentation of Professor Nizam was quite uh, good in a sense that how the government responded and provided opportunity uh, uh, to make sure that students learning will continue, especially at higher education. But his question is, is, uh, is there a similar approach or support uh, or the same case for the basic education in Indonesia? Uh, in terms of online readiness of students. Uh, if you have any knowledge on uh, what about the basic education program, uh, 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 do they have the same kind of support from the government and the students are ready for this kind of new change in the system? Yeah. Yes, uh, as I said earlier, yeah, yeah, the, the government also provides similar support for the uh, elementary K to 12 uh, on the use of technology, uh, like the online learning and the materials for uh, K to 12 actually is more, more abundant in terms of uh, free access and resources for the uh, 
uh, online learning and distance learning. Uh, but again, the problem is on the infrastructures. Not all schools have access to the internet. Uh, so currently we, are, we, we map the blank spots of the, the country and give the data to the Ministry of uh, Communication and Tele Telecommunication and Information. So hopefully in the uh, coming months, uh, we can cover uh, in a broader uh, area, especially in the remote uh, places. And again, I, I think currently the most effective is using the uh, television because the uh, coverage of the national television is almost universal. More than 99% of the population get access to the television. And this has been a very uh, good means to deliver in terms of the uh, teaching. But again, education is not just uh, teaching, but also the interaction. So this part is the challenge for us, I think, uh, how to uh, facilitate student learning. Uh, so what we currently uh, look at is like uh, teachers visit to groups of students in village for, for instance. So we are still considering that uh, given the pandemic in, pandemic in Indonesia is still not, we don't know uh, how long will it stay. Thank you. Back to you, Jose. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I have uh, another question here from our viewers. So uh, let me combine the question of Mr. Hazrab Hussein. So I think uh, in, in the experience now, we uh, some countries, um, including Japan or Indonesia, have already started their enrollment. Okay. So we want to know uh, with the current COVID situation, uh, uh, what is the enrollment rate? Is it increasing or decreasing? And uh, his follow-up question is that uh, when schools started to open, which I mentioned in, the, uh, in my introduction, there are new protocols because of like physical or social distancing. So we have to have a new system in the classroom. So how, what is the implication of this uh, impact of coronavirus? So whether we go online or we go for physical face-to-face -face, uh, classroom, uh, uh, teaching, so there are some implications. So, uh, is it okay that you share to us uh, your experience uh, of the two questions in terms of enrollment rate and the social or physical distancing and its implication to the classroom setting, including number of students in the class? So, may I? Yes, Professor Kitamura. Uh, because uh, I'm also a member of the uh, Board of Education at the Tokyo Metropolitan Government uh, of Japan. So. Uh, we've been also uh, really responsible for uh, closing and reopening of the school schools, and then we have had a lot of discussions on this this issue. And of course, you know, the social distancing is very key, and then that encourage students to keep certain distance. But uh, it's it's very very challenging for the small smaller kids to to keep that distance and. It's quite ironic and then uh, contradictory to the uh, the type of our mode of education we are trying to promote these days, which is you know try to encourage students to, to have more interactions, more discussions. We call like active learnings. So and then try to uh, promote student-centered learning. So in this new mode of uh, teaching and learning. Uh, Actually, we encourage students to interact more closely and then discuss more closely. However, uh, in order to respond to this uh, uh, difficult situation, we also we are asking students to keep distance. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult and ironic. And then I don't think any uh, kind of solution we have come up yet. However, probably uh, one, one is uh, technological advancement we may be able to expect a little bit that uh, uh, by using some of the devices, we can have more interactive uh, you know, learning, uh, learning environment. We can create more interactive learning environment by introducing some of the technological uh, instruments. So that uh, we, we may expect, but uh, you know, it's not easy for many countries, I mean, uh, even Japan, you know, we are struggling. Then, you know, you can imagine uh, it's so difficult for many other countries. In terms of the, so I'm sorry, I don't have uh, any sort of the solution to 
uh, this to to overcome this issue. But uh, I in, rather I would like to highlight the difficulties. But at the same time, that's a challenge we have to uh, tackle because, uh, as I show, the in this changing. Uh, environment and that, that many you know things are changing so rapidly and then technological advancement has been so accelerated we have to promote more active learning and uh, interactive learning uh, experiences among the, our students so it, it's a challenge I, i'm sorry that's what i can say at this moment and in terms of the enrollment i would say you know uh, because of the uh, this environment i i say some of the kids uh, may be able to join the uh, schooling opportunities because of the online or distance learning. So uh, that is actually happening in Japan. For instance, uh, we have been having some problem that some of students do not uh, adapt to the school environment, they cannot come to school, and then they stay home. But uh, now they, they feel a little more relieved that uh, you know, they can take some part of the uh, uh, learning process uh, uh, through via online but uh, uh, it's again you know it's not really uh, so uh, solving the uh, total situation yet so we have to think of uh, the impact to the enrollment uh, I, I'm sorry again this uh, this issue I don't have a much clear answer thank you very much professor Gitamura so may I have the answer of professor Nizam to the question? Sorry, I rather missed the, the question. What was the question? Was uh, so his, his question is uh, uh, the number of students uh, enrolled uh, in the new system because of the current situation. So is there any difference in the number of students enrolled? And then when they go for their classroom, there is now a social distancing or physical distancing, which also will create another kind of implication to the number of students who can be accommodated in one classroom. So how yeah. uh, is, do you have any experience on how you handle or how the Indonesian government handles such kind of situation? OK, so for the K-12, the number of new students more or less uh, stable because uh, not much difference. But in the higher education, the number of applicants going down quite uh, significantly perhaps 80% uh, uh, from the normal times. Uh, for the new students, for the uh, incoming students that will come to school this year, uh, they we will still continue study from home, with the exception for regions that is, uh, we call it a green zone, green areas, where there are no cases anymore uh, or not no no cases in the past three two two months so in this area uh, school can open but uh, with the the proper uh, protocols for uh, health and prevention uh, for the high education uh, since not everything can be conducted online like uh, laboratory works, research, uh, campus now start to open, but with capacity for like laboratory reaches to 50%. So the, the distancing uh, has to be assured uh, in the laboratory works, uh, workshops, studios, and uh, things like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So. Uh, we don't have much time, but I, I would like to ask uh, one more question, at least from me. Uh, I think I, I want to look at it at the more uh, uh, broader perspective. So we know that the coronavirus has impact on public resources of government budgets. Uh, but we believe that education will play a very important role in shaping our human capital for the future. However, the government now is more focused on uh, providing more budget for, to reduce health risk at the same time uh, addressing the economic recovery. So how these three sectors will compete for the, uh, you, you always say government has always limited budget. So how are we going to address all these issues while we look at economic recovery as very important, 
we look at reducing health risk is the most immediate need. But here comes also the people uh, that need to be educated from basic education to higher level of education. So uh, is there any experience or anything that you have uh, currently you're doing that can help our viewers understand how to look at this at the macro level? So may I invite Professor Kitamura for his view? Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. That's a very important but a challenging issue. I mean, you have raised, uh, and I I'd like to say two things. Uh, one is that uh, uh, if you think of the education budget in many countries, uh, both yeah. developed and developing countries, in fact, uh, uh, majority of education budget is spent for the recurrent cost. Recurrent cost include like teacher salaries, school maintenance, and so on. So, in fact, uh, uh, many countries has uh, it look, looks like many countries seem to have a huge amount of education budget, but that's a recurrent cost to simply continue the ordinary educational practices. So, in order to respond to this kind of very difficult situations due to COVID-19, we have to really top up the new budget to introduce a new type of teaching teaching and learning i mean new mode of teaching and learning and you know some including the uh, online or distance learning so first uh, i i think people have to understand that uh, in fact in many countries uh, the the amount of budget which can be spent for new things or innovative uh, challenges are very very limited so uh you cannot just talk about education budget as a whole you have to think of you know the what is the amount of the recurrent costs and then what to be the new thing i mean the budget for the new things and then we really have to increase this uh, you know uh we, we have to be careful you know we cannot reduce this recurrent cost but at the same time we have to increase the uh, new budget for doing something more innovative so that's one thing I first would like to clarify. And then second, uh, as I highlighted, the, the, you know, the, the how to convince people to uh, top up the new budget or doing something more innovative. Then as I highlighted, the, the triangular relationship, for instance, you know, the relationship in, between education, health, education, social stability, and so on. So. In fact, uh, education, sec education is related to many different issues. Uh, of course, the economic growth as well, but also, you know, uh, improving uh, people's health conditions, uh, people uh, improving the uh, social stability. So when you, you discuss the importance of increasing the budget for education, you know, education is not only for education sector, but it's a very much intersectoral across sectoral and then uh, that's that's that may be the way to convince people and also policymakers uh, why we need a more new budget uh, because we really need to highlight this uh, we, we use the word nexus nexus between education and health or you know nexus between education and some other sectors I mean, by highlighting this, uh, you know, very cross-cutting, cross-sectoral role of education, uh, that may be one way to discuss uh, how we could really keep uh, certain resources uh, allocated to education field. Of course, you know, it's not so easy, but that's uh, the comments I'd like to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gidamura. Professor Nizam? your view to the question? Uh, yes. Yes, it's a very difficult question to answer because uh, every government is now under uh, pressure uh, economically, especially to mitigate the, the uh, coronavirus. Uh, in, in Indonesia, at least, uh, for the Ministry of Education and Culture, the recurrent budget, we don't uh, touch the proportion of that budget. So we, we keep, we maintain the, the current uh, budget and increase even for the uh, social security net, like for the scholarships for students, uh, their parents perhaps uh, being laid off because of 
the the slow economic growth. So for those social safety net, we in, even in education we also uh, increase the the amount of recipients. But for the development budget and for the programs, uh, which is not the recurrent budget, we have to squeeze uh, quite heavily on that uh, respect. So that is the, the current uh, government policy. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you very much. So I think it's a big challenge really to the government uh, how to address the issue because yeah, while we want to reduce the health risk problem and put more money to economic recovery, but at the same time, these people are the one, you know, uh, the education sector also plays an important role because when we have educated people or workforce, I would say, you know, then we can they also help address other issues that we we've been discussing or we are facing this time so thank you very much so let me conclude this session this uh, one hour that the pandemic has impacted our education system and really offers an important reflection for our education leaders to question the status quo and explore new approaches for delivering quality education to millions of children and students the question is how can the global education community use this moment as an opportunity to build back uh, better to meet the demands of the future, especially on various skills that our education system provides to the learners. So this is the message we would like to leave in today's session. So we would like to invite Professor Kitamura for your final word. <laughs> Thank you, I, I was not really ready. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. As I said, uh, you know, uh, I strongly believe the power of education. You know, education is really a basic human rights, but uh, because you know, uh, we become, you know, I mean, that that means you know we cannot stop uh, providing educational opportunities to the people. I mean, not only children, but also the uh, <clears throat> across all the all the generations. So, of course, we have to, you know, uh, deal with this very difficult situation due to COVID-19. However, you know, uh, we should not stop uh, educate our education. That's that uh, message I really like to emphasize. So, let's keep up and then, you know, uh, let's work together. I, I really like the word uh, Professor Nizam introduced us, working, working together, sharing, uh, Sorry, I cannot pronounce it. Code, code, how, how, <laughs> 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 uh, we work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kitamura. May I invite Professor Nizam for your final message to our viewers? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think, uh, Jose, I think uh, we all believe that education is the most precious investment that we, we have to put for our future. Uh, this pandemic uh, has challenged us to think new ways of education for the future. I think the, the creativity of human being can overcome that. So it's time for us to, to be creative and to work together with Kotong Royong uh, to face this global challenge of pandemic COVID-19. And I believe with the human creativity, power, and also uh, as Benjamin Franklin uh, mentioned that in adversity comes opportunities. So it's our creativity that can take that opportunities out of this uh, pandemic in our education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So also the APO, the APO would like to extend our sincere thanks to, to you both, Professor Nizam and Professor Kitamura for being our speakers in this very interesting topic in a very serious situation that we are all facing. So I hope that our viewers were able to pick up something that they could also consider and reflect on when they think about their education system in their country. So with that, thank you very much. And we also would like to thank our viewers for watching this program. And we would like to request you to please like, subscribe and share the APO Productivity Talk. And with that, Thank you very much and see you in our next session. And my final word is Gotong Royong. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Arigato, Mr. Mas. Arigato, Mr.